Okay, welcome to the Reference and Adult Services section or RAS of Laconi. Um, we are here today to learn some of the best ways to conduct political and social programs in a library setting. My name is Shoshana Frank, she, her. I'm an adult services librarian at the Naperville Public Library and the Treasurer Secretary for RAS. And I am excited that today I am joined by my fellow board members, our president, Simon Serwinski, from the Itasca Community Library, and our vice president, Allison Lowry, from the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. We are thrilled that you all could join us this morning. After the program, the presenter slides and a short survey will be sent out to all participants. Thank you in advance for taking the survey as RAS uses this information to help plan future programs. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentations, so please submit your questions via the chat on Zoom. So without any further ado, let's dive right in for our first speaker. Amy Kuster is the Learning Experiences Manager at Skokie Public Library, where she oversees teams focused on public programming, hands-on experimental learning, and information and reference services. She also leads project teams focused on outcomes evaluation and civic engagement initiatives. Amy is the 2021-2022 Vice President of the Association for Library Service to Children, and she previously served on the editorial board for the Open Access Journal in the Library with the Lead Pipe. Take it away, Amy. Thank you so much, Shoshana, and for everyone with RAS for having this panel put together today. I'm really excited to hear from um, my fellow presenters as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, as Shoshana mentioned, you will be getting the slides a little bit later, um, so don't feel like you need to, you know, frantically take screen grabs or anything. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is the Civic Lab um, and civic engagement beyond our Civic Lab here at the Skokie Public Library. So I'm um, thinking about our Civic Lab, our initiatives for civic engagement, we really started this work back in 2016 uh, in the lead up to the general election. So a uh, very different context in a lot of ways from where we all find ourselves right now. But having that foundation um, is really integral to thinking about how, how we've evolved and where we've, um, where we've gotten to today. So um, we started our civic engagement initiatives from the perspective of the public library can be a convener of civic engagement. Um, and truthfully, the more that I've done this work and explored other libraries, um, it doesn't have to just be the public library. Library settings in general can be a convener of civic engagement. So thinking of ourselves as being invested in giving patrons opportunity to get useful resources, information that allow them to make informed decisions in any part of their lives. So there's not really a whole ton of difference between saying, hey, we're going to make sure you have access to consumer reports so that you can make an informed purchase on your next car or a microwave. Um, and also saying we want to make sure you have the information equivalent for um, social issues or items on the political ballot, the election, um, to help aid people in their decision making in all aspects of their life, including in civic engagement. And we really were thinking about this topic um, in 2016. That's when um, there was started to be more of a national consciousness of the idea of quote unquote fake news, which has only just become like an explosion of misinformation disinformation in the years since. Um, so those are the pieces that really spoke to us as a reason for why the library needed to think actively about our role in civic engagement in the life of the community. Um, our work is also based in the, the recognition that libraries are not neutral. So this can be a topic um, that, I don't know, comes up for debate in ways that I have personally found really not useful because libraries are not political. We do not affiliate with a particular um, political party or um, political uh, you know, faction or platform, but that doesn't mean that we are neutral. 
because we do believe in certain things. So if your library adheres to the Library Bill of Rights, believes in the freedom of access of information, you're not neutral. You believe in that you know, ability of everyone to get the information they need to live like a healthy and informed life. So that by very definition means we're not neutral. So that's something I always like to preface with when I'm onboarding a new staff member or talking to someone who's interested in the civic lab. We wanna be really upfront and say like, libraries believe in good information the ability of people to make up their own minds. So we're not neutral, but that's not to say we are political because we're not. Um, so part of that beginning work for us at the library was thinking about how we were going to define civic engagement. Um, so this is one of, I think, two wordier slides. Everything else is gonna be very image heavy. Um, so for us at our library, um, where we serve a village of about uh, 70,000 people, uh, over 40% of the population are foreign born, which means a high number of uh, residents may not be eligible for citizenship, but that doesn't mean they can't engage in the life of the community just because they can't vote. Um, so thinking about all of those pieces and how we define civic engagement. And for us, that means programs and opportunities that give everyone in our community the opportunity for a deeper, more critical understanding of how civic institutions operate. So for instance, you can think back to maybe your high school civics class. And is that really one of the last times that you got any information on how like the basic um, operation of government works? You know, we're all at a detriment if we don't understand what's happening with a potential, um, you know, inability to pass a new budget from Congress. Um, and so understanding how our civic institution to operate is a key piece of civic engagement. Um, there's also a desire to have a broader, more empathic knowledge of how issues, policies, and decisions affect lives. So it's not just pro-con um, thinking about kind of the structure of a debate between candidates um, before an election where someone is for something, someone is against. Those are like debating ideas without really talking about the impact ideas and policy have on people. And so for us, civic engagement is really tied to making sure that human connection is present and able to be explored. And then last but not least, um, leading to an increased awareness of and confidence in one's own ability to take an active role in civic discourse and participate in community decision making. So again, we very purposefully avoid using the word, um, you know, citizenship um, and talking about like being an engaged citizen because citizenship isn't something that's necessarily accessible to everyone in our community. Um, but that doesn't mean they can't be involved, can't make a difference. And so for us, civic engagement is as much about um, working with population, say teens who aren't old enough to vote yet on how they can have an impact on what's going on in their communities because everything going on in our community affects them. So with our civic lab, initiative, which is meant to be kind of umbrella inclusive of a lot of civic engagement opportunities, um, as opposed to a single program format. What we're trying to do is um, allow for folks who participate to be able to make up their own minds on issues based on credible information and critical reflection. So that is a lot of like multi-syllabic words to basically say what one patron summed up so well you need to have good information in order to make up your own mind. If you have bad information, someone else is making up your mind for you. Um, so that's when I was first talking with the Civic Lab about the Civic Lab with a patron back in 2017. We were just talking about how the Supreme Court works, and um, she was curious about you know why the Civic Lab. What are you trying to do? Like, are you trying to get me to believe a certain thing? And no, we're not. We're just trying to get people to have the information they need to understand so they can make up their minds. Um, and ever since she said that, you know, you need good information to make up your own mind. If you have bad info, someone else is making it up for you. Like that lens for thinking about what misinformation, disinformation campaigns on the internet, on social media, it's like a whole different way of seeing the world and seeing that like bad information isn't just like, Eh, it happens, like it can actively be detrimental to all of us. So what does that mean 
in terms of what our civic engagement has actually looked like. So I'm gonna go through an assortment of civic lab initiatives that we've had over the past five years. I do wanna know a fair number of these started and took place before the pandemic. So A, you're gonna see a fair number of photos without people in masks. Um, and B, some of these ideas might not be things that are feasible right now, just because of pandemic considerations, but um, it's my hope that they spark some ideas um, for thinking about how you just methods for engaging with people in the future. So for us, the civic lab concept really started in the lead up to the general election in 2016 with the civic lab boutique. So we um, repurposed a kind of darker corner in our library um, that had previously been used to hold music scores and created kind of a mini installation focusing on six topics that we had heard in a lot of community settings that community members were interested in headed into the general election. So you can kind of see some um, banners here along the back wall that those six topics were Black Lives Matter, climate change, immigration, income inequality, LGBTQ+, and reproductive justice as um, major topics that people knew there was um, some discussion of those topics amongst candidates. Some of that was gonna be on the ballot and they wanted to understand more deeply. And so this first initiative for us was largely passive on the part of library staff. We curated resource lists, um, had multiple copies of kind of core texts out and available for folks in the community. We also did try to encourage a little bit of interaction. So at this table you see in the middle, um, we had some conversation starters or thought provoking questions just to try and get people to reflect on what they know or what they were curious about. The uh, goal was not to get people debating because debating often doesn't work. Um, we were trying to give people opportunity to expand their own knowledge. Um, and again, be informed when it came to being involved in whether they were voting in the election or involved in the life of the community in another way. So we had kind of envisioned the Civic Lab Boutique as kind of a one and done sort of thing. But come uh, November 2016, we realized, oh, no, this is not only was this something that um, community members were interested in and engaged with, but also it's something um, that was going to continue to be vital as we saw just increased partisanship in national politics um, and just nationally, socially. Um, we wanted to think about how we could continue to use kind of the ethos of the civic lab based on information and learning, exploring, questioning, um, to continue to support folks in our community for um, just exploring what they cared about and understanding the, the implications of community decisions. And so what that looked like is our longest lived version of the civic lab, which has been civic lab pop-ups. So I'll also say you're gonna <laughs> through these slides get like a recap of all of my haircuts over the past five years. So I'm sorry, the haircut now is way better. Um, so you can see me in the central hallway of our library pre-renovation, we just finished a renovation a few months ago. Um, and what we would do for these civic lab pop-ups is we would think about what are topics that are in the news right now? What are topics that are coming up for, in conversation amongst community members? Maybe they're asking at the information desk or they're coming up um, ad hoc in book discussions or other programs. What are the topics that people are seeing and maybe don't know how to find out more information about them and how do we pop up in a space where there's a lot of foot traffic in the library to give people an opportunity to ask questions, share a resource, maybe pick up a resource or just think about to themselves like, oh, that's right. I kept meaning to look up more about what is the EPA so I can understand why it's in the headlines now um, and kind of giving that that them that invitation to dig deeper. So um, what is the EPA is actually what you can kind of see depending on the resolution of your screen um, in, this, in this picture. So it's an example of one of our civic lab information pop-ups that would really engage people on understanding some of the basic civ um, civic institutions in our country. Um, so I mentioned the Supreme Court, like what is the Supreme Court earlier? What is the EPA? Um, how do bills become laws? What is the budget? What is the deficit? 
So um, topics that we see a lot of headlines in the news or like information kind of tick across the bottom of your news channel of choice, but never necessarily get a lot of in-depth information or ability to explore. So that's what we've tried to do with Civic Lab pop-ups. Um, some of the core resources we always do, we always create a curated resource list handout, which if you um, are so inclined to explore the Civic Lab page of the Skokie Library website, um, you'll see linked handouts to all of those past events. Um, and so what we're trying to do there is not give like a pros and cons or like quote unquote both sides of an issue because spoiler alert, very few issues are two sides only. There's a lot of nuance. So for something like what is the EPA or like what is environmental justice, we might be looking at resources that help you explore it from a racial justice perspective, from a like food supply perspective, trying to get more nuance on thinking about how these systems work. So that's been the biggest example of Civic Lab uh, activities from our library. We did um, pre-pandemic experiment a bit with what we called rapid response pop-ups. So, you know, the pace at which new news stories um, bubble up uh, these days continues to increase. Um, things happen really quickly and people have questions really quickly. I don't know if you all see at your information or reference desk those questions people asking for to better understand things in the news, but we were definitely seeing that. We were also seeing a lot of students who were seeing like blurbs on TV and had questions. So what we tried to do with rapid response pop-ups is really just um, utilize staff skills around information seeking and pop up and basically in real time be able to explore topics that were in the news and help people um, find more information that they might be looking for. So whereas for our themed pop-ups on topics like what is the Supreme Court or understand, understanding space force um, for this rapid response pop-ups, our main handout was a go-to news resources handout. Again, that's one that's linked from our library website. An the idea there being how can we help people um, gain some skills and some confidence in being able to seek out credible information on headlines in the news if they find that they're not really getting the nuances or information they need just by the basic news they're already consuming. Um, for a little while pre-pandemic, that also morphed at some moments into having some news discussion groups. So we uh, were trying to move from the relative popularity of our like book discussion and other media discussion groups and have something for folks to be able to engage on major news stories. And so the format that we did here, instead of everybody reading the same book, um, what we would do is about a week before the program, we would choose a topic that was in the news right then and um, message all of the registrants and say, hey, read something from whatever news source you want on this topic and come prepared to like share a bit, both what you've learned, what perspective you think that news source is coming from and what questions you still have. Um, and so this picture here, you can see a little bit of an intro that we had um, getting at some news literacy first before going into smaller group discussions that gave people an opportunity to kind of round robin, go around and say, here's who I am, here's what I read, here's some information about the source, here's what I'm still curious about, and then move on to the next person. So giving everyone opportunity to share, um, but not uh, setting up a dynamic for people to get into like a back and forth debate. It's really about expanding the pool of knowledge so that people can then make up their own decisions. So we're excited to think about how the news discussion group could look again in future. Something that we found maybe you have too is that discussion groups just run a little bit differently when they're online versus in person. So we, like a lot of you, moved a lot of our workshops um, online over the course of the pandemic, and we're still doing a fair number of online pieces for the Civic Lab, including one coming up next month, exploring terminology around um, uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, Hispanic, Latinx, Latine. Um, and so what we did for those online workshops is we really tried to, again, center a variety of perspectives, um, have new sources from a lot of different um, resources, a lot of different viewpoints, 
um, and also structure around some group discussion questions. So we tried to structure this a little bit more as a, you know, you can see one of the slide examples here. How does news and media impact the public's understanding of vaccines? And asking the people in the room to share in the chat or coming off of mute and sharing from their perspective what they were saying. So um, our Civic Lab online workshops, again, relating to those core values of wanting to um, allow people to find information that's useful for them to make up their own minds, but also explore a greater variety of resources and perspectives. We've also, over the last um, couple of years, really tried to up our election information coverage. So here are two slightly grainy screen grabs from some Instagram stories pieces we did. One that had um, a like invitation to make your voting plan um, with library staff who speak a number of different languages, sharing in languages other than English as well as English um, to encourage folks to make their plan to vote. Um, we've also done some lightly scripted Q and A's on um, like what's on your ballot. So that's what you can see me at the top, slightly less bad haircut um, and Laurel below talking about what was on the ballot for the last general election. Um, and that goes hand in hand with some of the voter information that we have historically put on our website to make sure, again, we don't need to have the answers for everything. And that's like a core piece of thinking about how we prepare staff for civic engagement programming. You don't have to have the answers. You don't have to know how everybody is covering a story. You just have to really tap into those um, reference and information, uh, finding resources that we already have from our library library experience to be able to connect people to the information that they're looking for. So whether that looks like having election information proactively on our on our website, or I'm um, just talking through like, all right, how are teens engaging? How are we going to make sure that they're able to get the information they need? Are they stopping by the library and want to just chat? So how do we engage in conversations there? Um, so I don't wanna to go too much into intended audience because I'm getting towards the end of my time. And I do just wanna add very briefly um, with how do you prepare staff for civic engagement? Cause I know this can feel a little scary to a lot of staff, especially if they have come in with this perspective that libraries should be neutral. Again, we believe in information, therefore we're not neutral. So how do we really center that information and those um, information seeking skills? So I always really like to um, give analogies to how someone approaches any of our desks with a question. We ask questions in response to learn more what they're looking for and help them find the information that they need. That's exactly what we're trying to do with civic engagement. And the Civic Lab is really about developing platforms to be able to um, allow those sorts of interactions to take place. So that is a whole lot of information in a relatively short amount of time. Um, we're going to have time for questions for all of us um, after all three of the presentations. So the last thing I would just wrap up with is saying um, these are skills that we all already have. If you lead a discussion, if you work a public desk, if ever you encounter a patron's question, a community member's question, you have the skills needed to engage in civic um, engagement and the sorts of things that we try and do with the civic lab. Um, and what we found is that community members really want to be able to engage and learn in these topics. They just don't necessarily know where to turn. Um, and so people are really confident and love their library. Um, and so once folks know that they can come talk to us about these things and get more information, that can be a real boon for all of us. So uh, last but not least, there's my contact information. Again, you'll have my slides as part of a packet that comes um, after the webinar. Um, so feel free to reach out to me or visit our Civic Lab page if you are interested. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. That was great. Next, we have Courtney Tedrick from the Wheaton Public Library. Courtney has been working in libraries for 11 years and completed her MLIS at Dominican University in 2011. She has been coordinating programs for adults for eight years. She was hired as a reference librarian at Wheaton Public Library in 2013 and became department head of the brand new Community Engagement Department in 2017. Soon after the pandemic began, Courtney and her staff quickly pivoted to virtual programs and began implementing DEI programming in the summer of 2020. Take it away, Courtney. 
Thank you so much. Um, so I'm, I'm so honored to be here. Um, so for my uh, presentation, I'm gonna be focusing on our DEI program. So the social topics that we've been doing uh, during the, the pandemic. Um, so, you know, like probably all of you, when the pandemic hit, we quickly pivoted to Zoom. Uh, we wanted to um, prove our worth and, you know, keep our jobs. Um, a little background, my department handles about 90 to 90% of the adult programs at the library, as well as community partnerships and outreach. So, you know, soon after we were doing these virtual programs, um, the death of George Floyd happened and there were protests erupting around the country, including in Wheaton. We had at least two Black Lives Matter protests that I know of. And if for those of you unfamiliar with the city of Wheaton, it is a predominantly white city. It is historically conservative. It's very Christian. Um, it has Wheaton College, which is an evangelical Christian uh, college. Um, however, we had two very large Black Lives Matters protests, and there's definitely a wave, a progressive wave in the community, and that kind of told our department, my department, that there was a need to have these conversations, and we we felt it would be it wouldn't be a good idea to just ignore these issues that were happening. But my department, um, there was three of us doing programs, two full time, one part time. All of all three of us white women. So we are thinking we are not qualified to have these discussions to do these programs. But after talking about it, we kind of came to the conclusion, you know, if we don't, then then who will offer these to the community, because we felt it was really needed. So we started really small, we did a couple of book discussions. Um, we did how to be an anti racist for our nonfiction book club. Uh, book, book discussions are just a great way to have these conversations um, kind of in a in a safer, non, not as controversial way. So I always recommend starting off with book discussions. We also tried a TED Talk where um, my staff member selected TED Talks on focusing on racial equity. Um, unfortunately, we had very low attendance, so that was the only one we did, but it was a very simple format. Um, and we did it on Zoom meetings. So not all of our Zoom programs had great attendance, but I, it's a great way to start off. Um, we also did living room conversations and we partner with the League of Women Voters on that program. And we actually, we did a couple before the pandemic. The League of Women Voters of Wheaton are a huge partner of ours. And for those of you unfamiliar with living room conversations, I first was introduced to the concept during the documentary American Creed, which was, um, we showed that to our public as part of the American Greed grant. Uh, that was that we were a recipient of through ALA. And so what it is, it's a conversation bringing pretty much both sides of the aisle together um, to have a respectful, open conversation, um, to hopefully find common ground. And um, the League of Women Voters were, were also a partner of ours on that grant. And so started doing those in person and then we moved to Zoom and we did this topic, stereotypes, prejudice and bias. We did two sessions on Zoom meetings, small groups, because we wanted to keep the, the conversations within a small group and both time slots filled up. So from there, one of our city council members who attended reached out to my director saying, you know, these diversity programs are great. Can, you know, can we do more? So my director forwarded that to me and I said, yes, absolutely. Let's, you know, let's do a Zoom meeting. I reached out to um, a resident who is a DePaul professor who actually acted as the facilitator for us for that American Creed grant. And because we had spoken just about all these things that were going on, all the social unrest. And she said, if you ever want to do programs around these issues, let me know, I'd be happy to help. So we brought her into the meeting and my staff member who facilitated these programs. Who, and she also recommended we bring in this um, Wheaton mom who attended the living room conversation who actually started a, ta a parents group within the school district called DEI 200. So diversity, equity and inclusion for district 200, which is our, our local school district. Cause she said she was interested in you know, doing more in the community. So we all met on Zoom and you know, we we're just talking about what's what's going on, like how can we bring these conversations into the community? And so that Wheaton mom, her name is Anjali, she pitched this idea 
that she was doing for her work. She's a Microsoft consultant. She said she's doing these presentations where she just gives a general overview of these topics about surrounding race and racism. As you can see, colorblindness, white fragility, white privilege, systemic racism, and anti-racism. So kind of almost like a learning journey for someone who might not know about these issues. And she said, could we maybe do something like that for the library? And I said, absolutely, yes. We've never done anything like this before. This conversation is so sorely needed in our community. So it was just kind of a 10 minute overview that she would give based on research that she did. And then um, she formed these panels of experts to then talk more about these issues. And the panelists ranged from educators, subject matter experts, or just people of color from our community just talking about their experiences. So we really, we met in September and we started October 1st because we really wanted to take advantage of the timeliness of these, of these issues that were going on. And our group that we met, I'm gonna call it our DEI committee because after that we started meeting on a monthly basis and we still meet today. And the group kind of grew into community, all community members of Wheaton, but mostly educators or just community organizers who are just passionate about these issues. And with this series, we, we kind of came to the understanding this isn't a solution to this problem of racial justice. It's really just a conversation. We really believe that just starting with a conversation was, was the way to go. So these were our four panel discussions we had through October through January. And um, as you can see, we had all kinds of different panelists um, and they all just went really, really great. We had great turnout. Um, we partnered with DEI 200 and the school district promoted it for us as well. And it just, the community was really responsive and the, the feedback was really positive. I will say the orange one you see, we decided to call it the open to a discussion because we were going to call it like white privilege or white fragility, but Anjali said, we should not call it that. That's gonna alienate white people. I'm like, well, I'm white. It doesn't offend me. That's what we're gonna be talking about. We said, you know, we want, we don't want people to be dissuaded from coming. Let's call it be open to discussion because a lot of what we talked about in that session was just the discomfort with talking about these issues. So as a good partner, I said, okay, like let's let's do that. And I, I'm glad I did just because that very well could have alienated people. Um, so the green one, the systemic racism, that one we were the most excited about. That was kind of the big one. Um, it was really, really powerful. And um, all of these are on our YouTube channel. So if you want to check out any of them, I highly recommend uh, checking them out. Um, this one, we did get a little bit of backlash. Um, it was held December 3rd, so after the election, of the 2020 election. So, you know, I, I got one email saying, you know, why are my tax dollars being spent on this democratic falsehood, something along those lines. And I'm sure you're wondering, like, how do you respond to that kind of criticism? And for me, you know, for us, it's, you can't really respond to something, someone that says, you know, racism doesn't exist. So we don't respond to every single criticism that we get. If it's an open, someone wanting to have an open dialogue, a respectful dialogue, that's that's different. Then we will, you know, we'll respond to that. But um, there's also an email sent to um, the city council and the mayor that was forwarded to me just for me to read, um, just kind of saying all the stuff about the election, how Donald Trump won the election. So it was, I, I don't think they responded to that one either. But um, overall, the panels went really, really well. Um, they were well attended. I think the systemic racism one was where I said to our IT manager, like, we need to up our Zoom account. Like, we're hitting a, over 100. Not everyone was able to get in. So we need to, you know, increase that. So after our panel discussions, we wanted to continue the conversation, but invite the community into it because those panels were held on webinar just for the sheer volume um, of people attending. So we held community conversations on Zoom meetings. We invited all of our past panelists to act as moderators. I myself do not feel comfortable moderating these conversations. I'm not trained. My staff is not trained. I would love to be trained in the future. That's something that we, you know, we need to work on. But um, you want to have a moderator who's comfortable. Um, most of our moderators were um, educators, teachers. Um, so they're kind of used to moderating these 
you know, conversations, these difficult conversations. So we had two moderators per breakout room that we did. And they were small groups, about like eight or nine. And um, we had about 30 or 40 people attend. And, and it went really great. It was just everybody, the time was too short um, for everyone. And it was just a really great experience. So we, we continued that. We did another one in May. I'm gonna, our May programs kind of took a dip in attendance. So it was smaller groups, um, but we, we still felt it's important to offer these for the community to have the opportunity to talk about these issues um, you know, as a community. So um, we did that. And like I said, our committee kept meeting on a monthly basis, you know, community members just brainstorming, you know, what programs can we do? And really having this committee was so useful because they could reach out to speakers. I mean, they I hate they did some of the work for me. They would say I have the speaker that could speak, or they themselves, like my DePaul professor um, colleague, she actually did a lot of research, and that's her specialty. She's um, part of the Illinois Humanity Road Scholars Program, so she did this anti-slavery activism on the Illinois frontier, which she goes into her research on the southern the southern county in Illinois that kept. Illinois as a free uh, state during slavery. Um, and then she partnered with another one of our committee members whose research was in the demographic makeup of the northern suburbs. So they did the race in Illinois program. So we're really big on historic programs too, as far as you know, the history of, of you know, DEI history. So from there, um, some other programs that we did. This was a natural partnership for us with the um, Wheaton Chamber of Commerce and the Downtown Wheaton Association. We work with them all the time anyways. They're very committed to DEI initiatives as well. So this is a really natural partnership. So we just, and, you know, we use them to reach out um, to business owners of color in the community to come together for this panel discussion. So another one we did was we wanted to hear from our community leaders and I worked with that city council member on this one because she brought in the chief of police, the city manager, the superintendent, and my boss, uh, library director Betsy, was kind enough to join as well. But if you notice, all of our community leaders are white, and the community noticed as well, saying, "How are you doing this this DEI panel with all white people?" And that's definitely something that we, you know, brought up in the panel discussion. Like how can people of color in the community assume these leadership roles? So we wanted them to, to answer those questions. And so for our moderators, we invited uh, students of color in the community to add their perspectives and their experiences and their questions to our city leaders. And they did a fabulous job. So, so in May, we celebrated Asian American and uh, Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And I was gonna say, these programs were fantastic, but at this point, I did notice that our attendance had dipped in May. I don't know if all of you had the same issue, but people were being vaccinated, things were opening up, maybe people were fatigued with Zoom, maybe they were fatigued with DEI issues, which is very disheartening, but um, the programs are fantastic, especially this panel discussion about stereotypes that harm the Asian American community. Um, I partnered with um, the Community Relations Commission of the City of Wheaton. Um, one of their members found this um, discussion on Wheaton College's page and reached out to them to say, can you do this for, you know, again, for the community? And it was just, it was just so well done. And this is right around the time where all those hate crimes were happening to the Asian American community surrounding COVID. So it was very timely and it was just such a great panel discussion. Um, and then we had the amazing Dr. Ada Chang do her storytelling program as well that month. So it was around this time when, and I feel like we should have done it sooner, but this is the time that we crafted our DEI message. I do feel this is very important for any library, you know, doing these programs, especially us on our level. Um, it was just really important to tell the community, like, this is where we're coming from. This is what we're doing. And it is definitely part of our strategic plan through 2023. Um, so just kind of highlighting, you know, our goals. It's going to affect our not just our programming, but our collections, our displays, our services. Um, and then we link to the ALA's uh, website because we just found that very, very important. 
So we also celebrated Pride Month. Not only did we do displays throughout the library, but we had this fantastic panel with Outspoken Leaders, which is a Wheaton a nonprofit that serves LGBTQ plus youth, um, offers them a safe space and resources. And they did a fantastic panel discussion for us. And we also um, celebrated Juneteenth with this. This was an informational presentation. We actually formed a subcommittee of Black residents of Wheaton um, to kind of plan perhaps like a Juneteenth celebration um, in some programs. We came to the conclusion, the group did, that there was still too much pain in the city with Black residents of just the past harm that was done that they just felt now is just not the time. So we're kind of focusing on education just because so many people in the community don't weren't, weren't aware of what Juneteenth actually was. So we did this program and this was the big one recently that we did, critical race theory. Um, I'm smiling because this definitely we received the most uh, backlash on this one. So our committee talked, we wanted to keep, you know, we wanted to do timely programs. This was in the news. There was so much misinformation around critical race theory. And we really just wanted to educate the public. Like, what is it? I wasn't even sure of it myself. So um, I talked to the, those two professors that did those programs for us, because I was saying, I want these to be, you know, educators, I want them to be PhD college professors, um, especially professors of color to kind of give their perspective of CRT, but just to give it in a very unbiased, just factual, like these are the facts, this is what CRT is. And so my professor uh, colleagues reached out, I will say, if you can partner with um, professors, they are so much better at reaching out to other professors because I've reached out and sometimes I get no answer, but if they hear from a fellow professor, they respond right away. So um, we got these two speakers. I thought they did a fa fantastic job. I thought they were unbiased. They just gave the facts of what CRT is. I will say, you know, it was on our calendar for, you know, probably a month or so, you know, just on our calendar, didn't hear anything. So I'm like, oh, okay, I guess nobody is, you know, mad that we're doing this. And then the week of, you know, I'm posting on our, you know, a local Wheaton Facebook group, posted on our page promoting it, and then it blew up. Um, the, there are comments on both sides. You know, why is the library doing this? The library is biased. Um, we got phone calls, emails. Um, it was horrible timing personally because my son was sick, so I was working from home, so I wasn't even here to take the calls. But I will say my director was so supportive. I mean, my director and our board was supportive for all these programs. That's that's kind of key that you need. You need that support from your your higher ups. So, and I even asked her, you know, do you want? Is it okay if we we tackle this this topic? And she's like. She said, you know, we've come this far, we might as well go for it. So, you know, she fielded a lot of those calls herself, the board was aware. Um, and, you know, she was in on the call, she was in on really almost all of these programs. So, you know, we, we did it and, you know, we even said we're, because a lot, one of our biggest complaints from the backlash was, well, you're, you're biased, you need to show the other side of CRT which my director and I are wondering, what is the other side of CRT? Is it racism? Do we, do we wanna go there? Who, are we, who would we find as a speaker that's qualified to give the other side of critical race theory? So um, that is still kind of an open discussion we're having um, because we do have a couple of patrons that are still asking, you know, where are you on finding the other side of this issue? So. That's something that we're, we're discussing, but um, I mean, my director's response to a lot of these criticisms were, was, I mean, we had over 200 people on this webinar. Clearly it was an important issue um, that people needed to learn about. So, you know, this was a topic of interest and we, you know, gave it to the community. So that was, I mean, that was a big one. Um, I'm just glad that we had the support of my director and the board because as the moderator, um, some people were not happy that not all the questions were asked. We had at least 30 or 40 questions in the Q&A and not the time to answer them all, especially when all the questions were kind of the same, where it was one person who was against CRT asking, 
you know, what about this instance in this school where these kids were asked to do this and this and this. So I tried to, um, you know, combine them into one question asking about anti-white racism, which was basically the basis of that question. And that, that patron did not like that and said that I was biased and a terrible moderator. I should be disciplined or fired and sent that to all my colleagues um, on, the, on the department heads of the library. But um, I had the support of my, of my director and the board. So I try not to let that get to me. So after that, we just had this wonderful program a couple of weeks ago. Um, so this was in partnership, as you can see, with a lot of partners down below. Um, it started with um, the Community Relations Commission who wanted to highlight this historic march in Wheaton that happened in 1966. Um, on fair housing, because the Black residents of Wheaton, they were designated to live in this area that was built on a swamp and on the dump. They had to live here. And so they had this march. And then the next year, 1967, the first fair housing ordinance was passed in Wheaton, which is, I believe, the first Western suburb to pass one. But um, so the Community Relations Commission member actually found the two, the two March organizers, she found their sons and they agreed to sit on this panel and just to tell us about their fathers and about what life was like in Wheaton in the 60s as a black teenager. And it was just so powerful and just such an eye-opening experience for Wheaton residents to see this is what life was like in Wheaton in the 60s. So this was a really great presentation. So I know I'm over my time, I apologize, but my advice, if you wanna start, try to do any of these programs, start small book discussions, book displays, history lectures, and get support from your boss, from your director, from your board. You need their support in case you do get backlash, just to be offering these programs in the first place to see is there, is there a need for these programs? I would say every community would probably need them, but just to talk to them and have that open dialogue um, and prepare for the worst, because not everybody's ready for these discussions. Not everyone's going to like them. You know, have a plan, just mentally prepare for the worst. And then partner, that is my biggest, my biggest takeaway. Who could be an ally in your community? Which community organizations are already involved in this work? And if you're doing programs on Zoom, you know, reach out beyond your community. Who's out there across the country that could help moderate a discussion or give a presentation? So obviously reach out to your community, you know, city or village leaders, allies with power who would be willing to help, or just patrons, parents and students, um, community members, colleagues, fellow librarians, your board, and teachers and professors are a wonderful resource as well. If you have a local university or college, community college, or even a high school, try to reach out and make partnerships with those teachers or business owners, and then obviously community organizations and nonprofits. And I listed some here. Um, NAACP is an obvious choice. I know they are very busy. We have tried to reach out to them and they've just got so much going on. Um, but the League of Women Voters, we have a solid partnership with. They have always been willing to help and partner. So they're a great resource. And then I listed some other groups here. Um, together as Better Alliance and um, Rain are both in the northern suburbs, but they have been really just willing to help libraries at this time. So I listed some others here. You'll get copies of my slide. Thank you so much. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. And I did include my link to our YouTube page for our DEI programs. So thank you. Thank you, Courtney. That was great. Welcome Stephen Jackson of the Oak Park Public Library. Stephen is the manager of the newly formed Teen Services Department at Oak Park Public Library. Stephen joined the Oak Park Public Library staff in 2016 as a part of the integration of social services in public libraries. He is a restorative justice practitioner and has hosted a monthly national restorative justice and practices call intended to support those who are looking to implement restorative practices in library spaces. He currently serves on the Anti-Racism Advisory Board at OPPL, an initiative they started in 2019. Stephen is a husband and father to three boys, ages nine, one, and four months. Take it away, Stephen. Good morning, everyone. Can I be heard? 
Yes, we can hear That's you. Wonderful. Sorry. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, good morning, everyone. I am Stephen Jackson, as you mentioned, the manager of team services at Opart Public Library. It's an honor to be here. Um, what I want to do um, before I actually get started is to share a little bit about myself. I'm obviously having technical difficulties with the slides, I'm sorry. So sorry about this. It, I am having the strangest time working with this. Here we go, thank you. So um, what I want to do before I get started is to share a little bit about myself. Um, I, when, I, when I work with librarians, I always like to let people know that I am not a librarian. Um, I have a background in restorative justice. I worked with um, the local school district and local governmental agencies um, for the past um, 11 years now. Um, so the library world was fairly new to me. Um, Restorative justice. Um, what I want to share with you about is restorative justice, is what I consider a method of practice that creates an environment where every voice is heard and when harm is done, um, the aim is to repair that harm. I know in the previous presentations we heard about some issues um, where this may be the case, um, but, the, but the holistic well being of the people that was harmed is adhered to, and you, we're taking proactive steps to actually prevent further instances of those harms. Um, and restorative justice is sort of reactive in nature. Um, and then I want to share with you about um, what are restorative practices. Re restorative practices are pretty much deliberate and proactive approaches that aim to strengthen relationships between individuals and the communities that they serve. Um, so This initiative right here that you see on the slide in front of you is one of our initiatives that we started back in 2017, which was the barbershop. Um, what prompted, prompted this was um, I was part of a, a new initiative in 2016 to integrate social services within public libraries. Uh, I, along with Robert Simmons, who is the director of public safety and social services, um, joined the Opar Public Library, and we were at the, we were the fourth library in the nation to actually hire, hire a social worker to do so to serve the vulnerable populations that showed up. Um, barbershops are historically spaces where people can come in and in a safe space. Um, there, there are plenty of different conversations that happen in barbershops. Um, some may consider risk risque, um, and some may not. And one thing I love about barbershops, I don't know how many people on the call have ever been in a barbershop, but in, in, in barbershops, um, depending on who is in the space, certain conversations can be had. Um, so uh, for instance, um, if, uh, if, if I'm having a conversation about, let's just say a rap artist, um, or we're listening to some music where there's profanity, when the elder person comes in or a person that is older than us um, comes in, the music will all of a sudden switch, as well as the, the dialogue will switch. Um, political issues, on the other hand, are always open in the barbershop. So a barbershop historically is a safe space for people to come and have meaningful conversations. At the same time, get a fresh haircut, as you see the flyer. And, our, and what we wanted to do was create a space where anyone in the community could come in, and depending on who was in that space, they could have um, conversations. So what we did was on, on um, two Mondays out of the month, uh, Monday is historically a time when barbershops are, are closed in communities. So what I did was reached out to several barbershops, local barbershops in the community um, and asked them like, hey, this is what we're doing. We're wondering if you can come in, uh, we will provide the, the materials or whatever you need and we will provide a stipend for amount of time, um, a set amount of time and you cut as many heads as possible. So um, we partnered with several um, 
barbershops in the community. So we had a rotation of barbers that came in to have this offering to the community. Um, and what ended up happening was um, uh, patrons from all walks of life, people came in um, and got their first haircut. Um, our first two patrons were actually women. Um, one was an Asian American woman and a white um, female. So it, what it did was it opened our minds to what was possible in, in the space. And I think at, at the picture right there was one of our first um, patrons right there getting, getting a trim. So a barbershop was one of one of those those initiatives that sparked from um, community resources is what the name of the uh, department was called at the time, but eventually turned to social services, one of our initiatives. Every year um, since 2018, and this picture that you see here is the 2019 Restorative Justice Conference. Um, we have a Restorative Justice Conference, and what prompted the Restorative Justice Conference was people were asking a lot of questions about um, what actually restorative justice was. So in the first year, um, we actually, the, the first conference that we had was what is restorative justice? What we do is we formulate a committee and what we did was we formulated the committee. The committee meets from March to October. And usually um, on the first weekend of October, we host this conference, but due to COVID things have changed. This year will be in November. But um, for the past four years now, um, we've hosted this. And as you can see, the diverse group of people in there, a bunch of community members um, always participate when we in person. As you see, no one's wearing a mask, so you know this was um, pre-COVID. Um, so people come in. Um, the, the, the first year, people came in on the family day. Friday night, Friday evening was the time that we allowed, um, after we closed at 6 o'clock, we allowed several community members who registered to come in during closing hours. And as um, the previous presenter mentioned, um, institutional support is really, really key. I'll hit on that later on in my slides, but um, our executive director, as well as our leadership team, as well as our board, they approved um, for us to have people in. We just needed additional staff, but we had the support from the administration. And so what happened is we, we, we uh, had several community members come in and facilitate peace circles. Um, for those who don't know exactly what peace circles are, but peace circles are spaces where trained facilitators come in and create space, similar to barbershops, as I mentioned in the previous slide, where people can come in and share uh, meaningful dialogue, but un under the guise of respect. Um, so that, that, that initial night, we had um, 75 people, oh, it was over 75 people. Um, we partnered with the local um, community, Oak Park Township, to provide um, transportation for those who didn't weren't able, they only could provide transportation for the surrounding community, which Oak Park or River Forest, um, but they were to pick them up, pick the community member up, bring them there and drop them off as well. So we had several community members. We also partnered with a local um, daycare called Kisa Care, um, where um, she was able to bring her business to the library and provide childcare for those um, younger people who weren't, um, who couldn't really, uh, wouldn't really add value to the bigger community or in the bigger, bigger session. So she was able to engage with them. Um, a local um, Peace Circle guru, my sensei Pam Purdy facilitated a huge Peace Circle with, with, with the group. And what happened was like, as I shared, meaningful dialogue happened. People were able to have conversations around topics that they wouldn't normally, normally discuss. Um, we also partnered with local bricks oven local um, business and they provided the food um, at a cut rate um, that was a initial year i could go on and on about several years of the conference but th when COVID happened we went both virtual and during that conference um, it, the theme was the medicine wheel um, what we were talking about was how people used restorative strategies around mental well-being spiritual well-being um, physical uh, well-being and emotional well-being. Um, and we hit on those four areas. Um, and what really didn't, what really worked with that was the breadth of the conference, but what really didn't work for the staff and the volunteers who were participating um, was that we decided to have a month-long conference. So last year for the month of October, um, we met three days a week for four weeks. So um, that was something that we, this year, we're not necessarily going to do. We're only going to have a one day this year. Um, but um, that was something that didn't necessarily work or 
I'm not gonna say it didn't work, but it was it was extensive and it was very laborious on the staff. Um, so we, we would tamp back. So what I recommend is um, are, are using some of these strategies, reaching out to community partners, people who are in alignment with the mission uh, of your organization. And our strategic focus of Opar Public Library is engagement, learning, and stewardship. So there are several different areas where we could hit on those and reach out to several community partners and, 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 and create something of this nature. The Living History Project. So the Living History Project um, was a, a program, and I say was because it's no longer meeting, and I'll share with you a little bit about that now, um, as in libraries and in certain areas where you're working with teens, people age out, and with this program, um, several of the men, members aged out, went away to college, and, and became a little bit more independent. Um, so we, we're, we're revamping the program and offer a different rendition. But the Living History Project emerged from a $500 grant from the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. And what we were tasked with was to present a, present a program um, or a series that focused on American history or topics. So um, the young man you see um, in this presentation with the glasses, um, with the Afro, um, that is Billy J. Brooks, who was the Minister of Education for the Black Panther Party. Um, the Chicago branch, um, a 70 something year old man facilitated this program for um, two and a half years. Um, the very, very compelling man. Um, but what he did is he worked with several of these, these young people around social issues. Um, and he, he trained them up for about a month and every, every month, month and a half, they would do a presentation on what the information that they gathered and the research that they gathered. Um, one of the programs was the community community control of the police. Um, that was the highest participate, participation that we had. It was over 150 people um, in that virtual environment um, that had a, a very, very, very extensive dialogue about how um, policing looked within respective communities. And as the person that um, presented um, prior to me shared with you, when you're doing a virtual environment, um, you can reach out and you can you can have people participate in programming that wouldn't normally participate and you can cross state lines just like with our restorative justice um, conference virtual conference we had 20 people that were from different different um, areas around the country that participated in the conference that wouldn't have normally uh, participated in the conference if we were doing an in-person conference um, another uh, topic that they did was a town hall they presented, um, they just had community members come online and talk about issues. And these young people, um, as you can see, um, some of them um, in middle school, some of them in high school, and some of them um, recently um, coming out of high school is something that you, you know, if you provide a space for young people, they will thrive. Um, and that's what happened in this space. Several, several other um, sessions, but one of them was oppression within the prison system is another issue. Um, that they presented on and had, and they did, they did the outreach, the coordination and the organization of this and presented it. Um, and that was a highly participated event too. And one of the more recent presentations, the one prior to the last one, um, the young people presented with, um, presented on a, a, the Asian um, Pacific I Islander solidarity pr uh, presentation that they made. And that also was well attended. Um, several community partners, um, Northwestern, District 200, and these are local school districts, um, several um, community partners. So this slide right here um, is, um, the person in the slide is Rashida Graham uh, Washington. She is a person, um, a local business owner who owns a coffee shop where it's a community hub. Um, our executive director, David Sellup, met with her in 2019 um, for the whole uh, year of 2019, several months with a bunch of local organizations, heads and executive directors of an organization to explore what anti-racism would look like within their organization. Um, and what I love about me telling this portion is we, I heard us talking about um, George Floyd. We were on this journey, um, and I say it with pride because the organization was um, at the foresight to see some of these things because some of the 
um, behaviors that we were experiencing, some people um, who were experiencing homelessness um, and other different demographics within our organization weren't necessarily having a voice due to some of these issues. So um, in 2019, um, took it to the board um, and Graham, uh, Graham Washington came in and did an assessment. Um, she interviewed 50 stakeholders, um, staff, board members, community members. And what she did was do like an audit. Um, the information was very, very eye-opening, but what, what, what ended up happening was, um, and this, is, this, is, this came further down the line, but we had a dedicated budget around social equity initiative programs and projects within our organization, which never um, existed before. Um, we created um, our um, restorative practices coordinator, Tatiana Swansea, um, formulated that anti-racist resource challenge. And I'll share with you and some of the resources um, that came from that in, in, a, in a future slide. Um, and we now um, have an anti-racist strategic plan, um, which is very encouraging. And as I mentioned, our strategic focus of the organization, our engagement, learning and stewardship, our anti-racist strategic plan at this point is independent of our strategic plan, of our organizational strategic plan. But within a year to a year and a half, it will be integrated within our strategic plan and our strategic focus of our organization will become engagement, learning, stewardship, and anti-racism. So um, you all can imagine what conversations will come um, just using that term um, within, within the community um, as, as a whole. Um, so this is the journey that we're now on and that we're now at the point now where we're very close to hiring a director of equity and anti-racism who will be tasked with working with the leadership team um, and working with staff training and development and several other initiatives internally. And, and a lot of what I'm talking about is, is the internal workings um, that need to happen within the organization before serving the public. And we learned this from um, COVID. Um, prior to COVID, um, we had uh, eight trained staff members um, of re restorative practices, in particular restorative peace circles. Um, and post COVID, now we have 22 trained keepers. And what happened was um, the initial cohort of people that were trained in restorative practices, um, peace circles, uh, we didn't really have a direction to, um, or audience to serve. So we turned inward and created support staff circles for our staff and, and found out a lot of information um, that where we could support internally our staff. And so we did this virtually and other, uh, other uh, staff members were very curious about these practices. And um, eventually we, we had additional 13 to 15 staff members trained um, during COVID. And what, and what the, this tool was very instrumental in, in us creating safe spaces. Uh, we now have an, a black affinity group that meets monthly um, for staff members. Um, and what this does, this helps us have conversations with staff members and community members and, and create the safe space um, to do so. Um, Peace Circles promote respect, equality, empathy, problem solving, responsibility, um, self-regulation and self-awareness, as well as shared leadership is one of the most important um, components of that. Um, one of the people that I like to highlight is our director of HR was trained. So you can imagine if, if this person is trained in restorative practice, how this can trickle down um, from the top down um, to the rest of the rest of the staff. So as I mentioned, um, Tatiana Swansea, our um, restorative practices um, coordinator, um, created the resource challenge. Um, and these are some of the some of the some of the books and the authors um, that 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 stem from the challenge. And this challenge um, was had five different things. Um, one of the things was how did we get here? And what that did was it created a historical context for racism, um, for structural racism, the white supremacy culture, um, and very 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 powerful topic. Um, the theme. The, the second theme was policing, mass incarceration, protest, and um, Black Lives Matter and, and liberation. Um, and the third theme was contemporary, contemporary Black life in America. 
um, the fourth intersecting identities and the fifth and final was how we how can we um, uh, take action all year around so bringing culminating all of these um, into 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 um, creating an action year round and not just during Black History Month or um, during certain when events certain precip precipitating events happen um, and then we then we're doing these things we're doing this thing all year round um, to be proactive as I mentioned earlier what restorative practices are they're proactive ways of doing things within the community so you don't have to be reactive when things do um, happen um, as you see these are other things that that stem from it um, we were able to partner with um, the K Ryan Center the K Ryan Center for the arts is a, a, a circle Ur otherwise known as circle urban ministries is a local community organization um, that's about 47 years old in the community in the Austin community um, uh, forest park public library of course us river forest public library just surrounding libraries local bookstore as well as the village of old park um, we're, we're, we're partners in this and as you can see a prison by any other name another discussion um with the with the speakers there um also did occur so practical things um that we can do um and you can find these in april's edition of the library journal i i, I uh, wrote an article about restorative libraries um and so these are practical ways that um that you could just get started on making sure that the, the safe spaces and civic engagement um, social conversations, just different things can happen. Um, so the ensuring a mission alignment, as, as you heard me talk about um, a few times about our strategic focus, which is attached to our mission of our organization, is mission alignment. It is hard for anyone to say no if what you're what you're doing is aligned with the mission of the organization. It's almost impossible. It's antithetical to um, the or what organizations do. So ensuring mission alignment is a surefire way um, to make things happen. Assessment. Um, as I shared with you earlier, um, uh, RGW, Rashida Graham Washington, she did an initial assessment with the 50 stakeholders um, within the library and within the community. So she was able to gather information, create a report, share it with the executive director. And this is how we got on this path that we are now on. Um, to do these particular things. Asking restorative questions. So you may ask, what exactly um, is a restorative question? Um, restorative, restorative questions are questions that, um, that really ask, prompt you to get curious. Um, they're not, they're not um, committing harm. Um, they're respectful. Um, they're just basically open-ended questions uh, with how, how to mitigate and how to prevent instances of harm happening so you, when you ask these questions to community members or to stakeholders or to um, the staff um, you can really get to the meat of, of, of where you can focus and where you can have um, partnerships uh, say yes and figure out the rest later when people bring things to you especially when you're in a position of leadership um, i've talked to several leaders about this um, saying yes and then figuring it out later is 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 really a good practice to have um, because it shows support um, and trust in who you're who, who is asking the question. Um, I don't say it generally uh, and yes to everything, but um, saying yes is, is is a good standard practice. Start with teens. I am the manager of teen services. Um, teens have a place in my heart. They always have in the work that I've been doing for the past twelve years. But starting with teens. That's a good place because in most libraries that I've dealt with or, or have conversations with, teens are uh, an area um, where a lot of issues come up, and some of the some of the issues are around um, racism, um, ageism, d d several different isms um, of a population whose brains are are constantly developing. So starting with teens is always a good place to start, and I'm biased. Creating a welcoming environment is it's sort of a no brainer, but like something simple as um, uh, pre COVID standing at the doorway and welcoming people, having conversations, getting to know people um, in a way is, is, 
is a really good way um, to create a welcoming environment. I know I'm going over, I have two more. Build a team of community partners. Um, that is very essential. I know a few people said the same thing. I am reiterating, I came in third, I think. So like I, I am reiterating what the other pre presenters have said. Building a team of community partners, is, it makes it really um, difficult um, to dispute what is what, what, you're, what the initiative that you're pushing forward. Um, here you see several of the community organizations that we've been working with uh, within our organization around anti-racism, um, some of our community partners, um, information is right there. And as they mentioned, you will have the slide, um, slide so you will be able to pull this information. Um, last and not least, I wanna thank you all um, for bearing with me. My information is right there. And if you have any questions, um, we'll respond to them much later. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you to Amy, Courtney, and Stephen. I have like scribbled so many notes down. This has been an incredible uh, morning so far. And uh, as promised, we do have time for questions from the audience. So please put in your questions in the chat. And um, if Amy, Courtney, and Stephen could turn on your videos, there we go. Um, because let's see, doesn't look like maybe everyone's typing right this moment. Um, so uh, I did have a question that I would be happy to ask. Um, one, one of the things that was a really key component that you all mentioned of creating and building community partners. Um, and as someone who is still working on creating those, those partnerships, how did you start? Like what, what type of focus did you have to reach out to people? Was it relationship building? Like how, how did you get started on building those partnerships? So I can go. Outreach is the key component um, in everything that I do uh, as a person as well as professionally. Um, so I, I, I grew up in Oak Park, so I knew, I knew a lot of people in a lot of different, different spaces. And prior to, I, 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 like, as I mentioned in the presentation, I am not a librarian. Um, so I came from a different profession prior to, and, and our irony is a lot of librarians that I do know come from teaching backgrounds. So um, they have relationships with schools. So um, outreach is very, very important. Creating welcoming, uh, a welcoming environment, as, as I shared, in there when you when you when you sit down and have a conversation with someone or have someone who is tasked to do this um, within the organization you find out a lot of information um, and you can partner with people um, in, in within the community as well that patronize the space i'll jump in that definitely yes outreach um and i loved steven's advice of say yes and then figure out the rest later because I feel like I, that's that's what I do. Um, I, I hate saying no. I very rarely say no. And I feel like the more you say yes to partner organizations, um, the more allies you do have, the more partners you have. And that just opens the door to other partners and to future partnerships with, with that organization. So, and we, we were heavy on partnership before the pandemic. So they were really key in working with us when we kind of pivoted to virtual. And I mean, a lot of our partners have come to us because they know that we're open to partnerships. So just saying yes and being open um, is, is definitely key. And just really identifying which other organizations are there out there in your community that you could potentially work with and just reaching out to them. Yeah, I think, identifying who's in the community and reaching out. Um, one of the things that we really try and do is uh, the same way that like our civic engagement is based around what are the skills we already have and are good at, what are community organizations or community members, what skills and talents do they have that they can bring and like connecting with that on a, I see your talents and I see like that sharing those more broadly can have a positive impact for everybody. Um, and then being open to where that relationship might go. So maybe it is just like the sort of thing where um, 
so trigger warning about suicide in the news, but when a couple years ago there were a couple of high profile deaths by suicide, we reached out to one of our um, local mental health support resources who like that's their expertise. They do that day in, day out. We don't need to learn those skills because we can work there. And we asked them to come in and, and work with us on a civic lab, like exploring mental health and um, suicide. And that could have, for we worked with a couple of organizations. One of them, like that was the core of our interaction. And then for another, we've since developed a stronger relationship and done more. Both of those are really valid. So I think for us being open to um, what is the natural evolution of a relationship, of a partnership that can be really positive too. So you're not trying to force something that isn't there. Wonderful, thank you. Well, can I add one more thing? Um, you know, I, I, as I shared with you, I started with the social services or community um, resources department. So we, our model was a community outreach model. So we didn't, we do not provide direct services uh, as social workers uh, in, in public libraries. Our model, uh, we had to reach out. So we have over 56 partner organizations who come in and provide mental health, um, senior services, domestic violence. We have eight different domains um, that during our assessment that we found where people have certain needs. Um, so that was the way I came with it. I came in the library world as being, I had to turn, you know, I had to turn outward to the community to find different partners to help the people who are experiencing homelessness, the people who had mental health issues to the point now where we have, we've partnered with Northwestern, I mean, Rush, um, Chicago, and we provide free mental health assessments for anyone because we are a public library. Anyone can come in and get a free mental health assessment. And we then we partner with Rush, and now we have um, seven free sessions um, for people to have with an assessment. And this assessment costs two hundred dollars. Uh, so to have a free uh, assessment, mental health assessment, um, breaks down that barrier for some who have it to get to some of the services that they need. Great, thank you for, for adding that. Um, so we do have a question from the audience. Um, it's stated for Courtney, but I imagine anyone could jump in. Um, for the additional programs that were added that were DEI focused, um, did that take away a place from a traditional program or was it just an addition? The answer is both. <laughs> um, so we are, so, so fortunate at our library that um, we are able to do a lot of programs. Um, that's really important to our library. We get pretty good attendance even on Zoom. And as I said, um, my department, there are three of us doing programs, two full-time, one part-time. So even during the pandemic, if you look, and even if you look at our calendar now, you'll some some weeks we do like four to five adult programs or more a week. Um, just because we love it and we we want to offer that to our community. So I would definitely make DEI programs a priority. Um, or if, you know, a partner came to me with an idea, and a lot of these were pretty last minute that we had to kind of scramble and throw together, I would try to make room in the schedule. I would say, okay, I have this night open. I have this night open. Would that work? So I would like make space for it because I thought it was important. Um, and now it's part of our strategic plan. So I can go and point to our strategic plan and say, you know, we are prioritizing these kinds of programs. But on the other hand, you know, some of our like history programs, for example, we, we do history programs every now and then. And if we, you know, cover a topic like that anti-slavery on the Illinois frontier, to me, that's kind of a traditional program, just a different topic. So I guess the answer is both. So I think there's always room to fit it into your regular schedule. Wonderful, thank you. So we do have another question of uh, from the group. Can you speak to your experiences with people who aren't respectful? Um, Obviously this type of programming is imperative, but they can also create strong emotions. And they're curious if any of you have encountered it and how you've prepared staff to deal with these interactions. I can start with that one. Um, Cause that definitely when I'm um, bringing new staff into like the civic lab initiative, um, that's usually their largest concern. Like what happens if someone gets confrontational 
And um, we really focus on like, you know, just drilling down that the civic lab is about information. And so focus back on information. Like people can't really fight in any sort of way when your response to them, like saying something provocative to you is like, oh, I haven't read that. What resource did you find that in? And like making it about information seeking as opposed to a debate. Um, and so because like we kind of role play that with staff, we've actually never had a, a situation in which like it became a confrontation or a volleying back and forth or someone being actively disrespectful. Clearly there have been some people who've like shared things intending to be provocative, but like at the end of the day, they don't really want to talk about, you know, their news finding habits. Like they wanted to get a reaction and we're not giving that. And we're just focusing saying this is about resources. I wasn't aware of that one. I'll have to look into it. Thank you for sharing. And then they kind of go on their way. Wonder. Oh, yes, please go ahead. We, we have trained staff. As I, as I shared, we have people who are trained in de-escalation. Um, there's a component to that with the restore, with our restorative practitioners, as well as um, our public safety uh, department. Um, Th that is the community outreach model. So um, when they build relationships with people, um, they know how to approach people. They know how to de-escalate a situation when things happen, know how to move a person from a situation because this is what they are trained to do. Um, train mental health, first aid, verbal judo, um, Narcan administration, several different skills that they have to mitigate those, those instances where, where people get disrespectful. So I'm hearing training is key for these conversations, which is excellent. Yeah, training and like preparation, that role play. So the first time a staff person needs to say it isn't like live in the moment, but rather something that they feel comfortable saying. I was gonna say for our community conversations, we do have moderators that are, they're educators. So they're not formally trained, but they, you know, they're teachers in the classroom. Our staff are not trained yet. That's something that we would love to do. But um, we, you know, our, our series was on Zoom webinar. So we definitely saw some, you know, questions in the Q and A in the chat. So not quite as confrontational, but, and we've been just very lucky in our face-to-face -face Zoom meetings. Um, where we haven't had anything too disrespectful, but we do preface it and have expectations and we do have our patron code of conduct um, and are prepared if, if something does happen out of line, which thankfully it hasn't. But yeah, I agree, just being completely prepared, having a plan of what to do if, if that does come up. Excellent. Um, well, again, I cannot express our gratitude enough for Stephen, uh, Courtney, and Amy. We are so glad that you shared the morning with us to share your, your best practices from your libraries and your experiences. Unfortunately, our time has come to an end. Um, but again, thank you for all the participants for joining us um, and our amazing panelists. We do hope to see you at another RAS program in the future. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Bye-bye.